Good evening. Yes. We're going to get started at 6.30, and I'd like to welcome you to Franklin Public Library. I'm Jennifer Lapa, the Library Director, and tonight's Great Decisions discussion is on the U.S. Mideast Foreign Policy. Present. First, I'd like to thank um, our sponsors, the Franklin Public Library Foundation. We couldn't do this without the financial support of the Jerome J. and Dorothy H. Holtz Family Foundation and Carol and Tom Donovan. So we thank them for their generosity and their support of this important program. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Beth Dockerty. She's the Manger, 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 <laughs> Professor of International Relations and Professor of Political Science at Hawaii College. She received her MA and PhD in Foreign Affairs from the University of Virginia. She has chaired the Beloit College's International Relations Program since 1996, and she has been a frequent speaker at past Franklin Public Library Great Decision Discussion Series. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Dougherty. Thanks everybody for um, having me back and for coming out um, this evening. Um, uh, slides. Um, so, what I am uh, going to um, focus on this evening is going to be on the impact of the uh, current hostilities in the Gaza Strip uh, for U.S. foreign policy. The Great Decisions um, booklet theme was uh, realignment in the region, and I would just note that the whole idea was when Biden came into office that there was going to be a realignment of U.S. foreign policy, which goes back at least to the Obama administration, which basically was Obama, and then Trump, and now Biden. They want to get out of the Middle East to focus on um, the U.S.'s competition with Russia and China. Right? The war ends in Iraq, the war ends in um, Afghanistan, the U.S. pulls troops out of both of those places, that the Middle East is going to be less important to U.S. foreign policy. Well, that, of course, has completely gone out the window um, after uh, the events of October 7th. Um, it's very clear that the United States is, is not going to be able to easily extricate itself from this region. Um, and the freedom of navigation um, piece to this, which is connected to the Gaza war that implicates what's happening in Yemen, one of the things that's become very apparent there is that only the United States is interested in ensuring freedom of navigation on the high seas. Right? And so um, instead of the United States drawing down its military presence uh, since October 7th has actually increased. Um, one of the key interests that the United States has had in the Middle East um, since the end of the Second World War, but more importantly since the early uh, 1970s, is to ensure the safety and security of the state of Israel. As part of that, the United States has supplied more aid to Israel than it has to any other country in the world. It, um, you can see that, let me see where's the little, where is it? Uh -huh, oh, there, okay. So there, um, the yellow line actually is, is economic aid, um, which ended here in the early part of the 2000s, because by then, um, Israel's per capita income was on par with Spain, and it seemed silly to be giving them economic support funds. Um, but I would also note that, you, that it is not until you get to the late 1970s um, that you really begin to see large amounts of U.S. military assistance to Israel, and then that has been very consistent, right? So this is a $5 billion line, um, and the U.S. is uh, generally at about three and a half or three billion dollars a year for the, um, for the Israelis. As I said, this is the largest amount of assistance the United States gives to any individual state, and this deeply, deeply implicates the United States in what is happening in Gaza because the United States supplies Israel with a very substantial portion of its own defense spending, right? So 
over half of all of U.S. foreign military financing goes to Israel. And U.S. military assistance to Israel accounts for over 16% of Israel's defense budget. <clears throat> the weapons that Israel is using in the Gaza war are weapons that it acquired from the United States. There have been three major transfers of um, uh, mat ma military material uh, since the October 7 uh, war, and at least 100 much smaller transfers, because Israel is considered a major ally. If the US transfers military uh, weaponry to it under $100 million, that does not need to be authorized by Congress. Right? So there has been a substantial amount of um, things like um, artillery shells, uh, precision-guided bombs, etc., the kinds of things that Israel is using in the war in Gaza. Outside of the United States, um, in most other places in the world, um, <coughs> public opinion is heavily against the United States on this issue. It's very damaging to U.S. credibility. Um, and whether the U.S. likes it or not, for many other places in the world, what Israel does reflects directly back onto American foreign policy. So there is this expectation elsewhere um, that the United States has leverage over the Israelis that it should be using to try to change Israeli behavior um, in the war in, in Gaza. Israel gets all sorts of special privileges in terms of its assistance. So it's not just that the U.S. gives it more money than it gives anybody else. First, Israel gets all of its money up front, right? Usually you spread it out over the course of the year, but as soon as the new fiscal year kicks in, Israel gets the full amount of what the United States um, uh, has pledged to it. Also, the U.S. has been using these 10-year uh, memorandum of understanding. So it sets out for a 10-year period how much aid the United States is going to supply to the Israelis. It, um, the U.S. has committed itself to what's called the qualitative military edge. <clears throat> it, that Israel must maintain a qualitative military edge over all of the other states in the Middle East in order to be able to protect itself, right? So this is part of the safety and security of the state of Israel. And there are a number of things that um, go into maintaining that um, qualitative military edge, right? Israel gets first crack at new um, U.S. defense technology. When the United States sells advanced weapons systems to other countries in the Middle East, Israel either gets a more advanced version or the ability to customize that version. In the event that um, Israel's already operating a weapon system like that, instead what we might do is give them an offsetting military package, right? So something that it can compensate or increase their military strength because we sold Saudi Arabia or the UAE, for example, F-16 fighter jets. Okay? Um, Israel is also able to um, uh, have access to excess uh, American uh, weaponry. The U.S. has a substantial stockpile of uh, weapons and munitions in Israel that Israel is permitted and has been tapping into. It, um, and so the is oh, and the other part of this is usually if you get money from the United States for your military, you have to spend it on stuff the United States makes. But Israel is one of the world's leading defense um, manufacturers, and so the Israelis are actually allowed to spend their money on their own, buying things from themselves, basically. It, um, so as you're all aware, um, on October 7th, um, Hamas launched a massive attack into Israel. It broke through the very substantial fortifications that Israel has along the Gaza border. Um, it broke through the wall in at least um, seven places, you've seen on, along here. Um, and then it was able to advance into um, Israel along this line. Right? And of course, Hamas forces were on the ground for a number of hours before they were eventually um, <coughs> pushed back by Israeli defense forces. You had widespread um, uh, use of mass killing, of sexual violence, of arson, 
uh, in addition to the 230 Israelis that were then taken hostage by Hamas and taken back to the Gaza Strip. There are still 130 Israelis that are being held by Hamas, um, not just Hamas. There are 130 Israelis that are still in captivity. They're being held by Hamas and a variety of other um, armed groups within the Gaza Strip. It is believed that probably um, at least 30 of the 130 have died um, during their captivity in Israel. And so of course, one of the, the main calls is for there to be um, a return of the hostages on the part of Hamas, and that's part of what the negotiations are that's, that's going on. Okay. Um, when um, October 7th happened, Biden um, tightly embraced Israel. It's unsurprising to me from a personal perspective, um, Joe Biden has a, a long and deep relationship with, with Israel. Um, the United States said it would stand by the Israelis, right? It has um, protected it at the uh, UN against any sort of um, uh, UN Security Council resolutions that are viewed as overly hostile to Israel's interests, right? But this is becoming more and more and more untenable for Joe Biden. Okay? Part of that is because the massive amount of casualties that have been suffered in Gaza. At this point, um, there's probably about 32,000 people um, that have been killed uh, during the, during the um, hostilities since then. According to Oxfam, this is the deadliest rate of killing that we've seen in any major conflict in the last 24 years. So Oxfam is estimating that 250 people a day are dying in the war in Gaza. Just to give you a sense of, of how massive that number is. The corresponding figures for Syria are 96.5 per day. For Iraq, it was 50.8. Ukraine, 43.9. Yemen, 15.8. So in terms of the number of people who have been killed in a short period of time, this is, this is unprecedented, what we are seeing in, in Gaza. The other piece to this is the absolutely massive displacement of the population. Um, at least 75% of the 2.2 million people who live in Gaza have been displaced from their homes, and some put that figure um, even higher. So this gives you um, an, an indication. Gaza is divided. It's got five districts. All right, so this down here, this area, this is the Rafa district, right? This is where the majority of the internally displaced persons have had to go. And this is the area where the Israelis are currently saying that they're planning to have another military offensive. Um, the entire northern part of um, Gaza is basically where Israel is operating in terms of the military. There are about 300,000 people that are still living in, um, in this area, but they are almost completely out of the reach of any sort of humanitarian assistance. It, um, and so the human rights and humanitarian costs of this war have been eroding support for Joe Biden, right? So um, this question is asking US adults, and, and this was from um, uh, January, late January of, of this year asking U.S. adults if they thought the military response from Israel had gone too far. And you can see and that it was 40% in November. Now it's 50%, and it's probably even higher than that, but this was the last time I could find that someone had asked this particular question in, in a poll. What I think is interesting here is that when you break it down, it's unsurprising, you know, Democrats um, have not been happy with Joe Biden, 58 to 62, that's still relatively on um, you know similar levels, but if you look at Republicans, right, they thought in November that Israel's response was about right. Now you have a third of Republicans who are saying that Israel has gone too far. And again, this is before the news about the impending humanitarian um, catastrophe became public. Biden has been underwater publicly from the very beginning about this. Um, very few people approve of his handling of the conflict in, um, in Gaza. 
And this is part of the reason why in the State of the Union address, right, that, that he made it clear that he also believed that Israel um, had gone too far and that the United States is trying to get Israel um, to rein in its military um, operations in a way that will reduce civilian casualties. And of course, this isn't an election year. And so this has massive implications for the presidential election in November. You've seen in uh, a number of states, and it started in Michigan, these campaigns to get people to not vote for Joe Biden in the Democratic primaries. Um, in Michigan, actually, this was a very well done grassroots campaign. If anybody's interested in sort of like how do you do grassroots organizing in a very short period of time, uh, The Guardian UK ran a fabulous article about uncommitted Michigan um, in the last week or so. They were hoping to get 20,000 people to vote uncommitted. They got over 100,000 people. And when other states saw how well things had gone in Michigan, then it kind of had a knock-on effect. Um, by the way, the numbers behind, these are the number of delegate, delegates to the um, Democratic National Convention that have been won by uncommitted, right? So these are protest vote. As many of you are aware, this is mainly um, uh, an issue, the, the lower you, you know, the, the lower you go down on the age scale towards 18, the more sympathy you find for the Palestinians and the more anger that you find towards Joe Biden. And of course, in places like Michigan and Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, these are critical states uh, for Biden thinking about the election in November. Those are all prominent swing states. If in fact, um, I mean 100,000 is enough to have swung Michigan the other way in the previous election. Right? So it's very clear that there is now starting to be some a substantial, still minority, but now an organized and vocal minority in the United States trying to push the Biden administration to exert more pressure on Israel. The logic being, of course, that the United States provides over $3 billion a year to Israel. So that looks like the Biden administration should have substantial leverage. And the hope was also, I think, from the Biden administration's um, perspective that if they embraced Israel early in this conflict, that it would give them a little bit of influence over Israel's subsequent military campaigns. That has simply turned out not to be the case, right? Um, and just in the last uh, few days, Biden had the first phone call he had had with Benjamin Netanyahu um, in over a month, and Netanyahu is pushing back very hard against uh, what the United States is asking the Israelis um, to do. But what we have in front of us right now um, in Gaza is not a humanitarian crisis. We are literally on the brink of humanitarian catastrophe. It, this is a comparison of Gaza with what's happening in Sudan, the war in Tigray, which was in Ethiopia um, in recent years, and then the war in Yemen. It, this first flame here is the percent of the population in need. It, the yellow is civilian fatalities per 100,000 people, and you can see for um, the other three crises that that flame barely even registers. The orange is the number of people that have been displaced by that, and again, you know, the, the larger number here is 17% for um, Tigray. We're talking about 75 or 80% in Gaza. And then this last number, aid worker fatalities. 24% of all of the UN aid workers who have been killed since 1997 have died in Gaza since October 7th. It, there's been a, and this is unprecedented as well. Again, you can see it's very rare that you have large numbers of humanitarian aid workers who have been killed. The individuals who um, have been killed, the aid workers in Gaza, um, are not, for the most part, have not been killed on the job, but actually have died in um, when their houses have been bombarded. Okay. Nonetheless, this is a, a real concern for the international humanitarian um, community. The blue is um, how much funding is uh, needs have been covered, and then the bottom one is the number of aid organizations that are operating in um, 
in a place. It, Tigray, by the way, was under a, a humanitarian blockade the way Gaza is, which is why there are so few agencies that are operating there. The lead agency in Gaza is the UN Relief and Works Agency. It was created in 1948 before the UN um, Refugee Agency was created. That was 1951. <clears throat> UNRWA was uh, created, its uh, mandate is specifically and only to deal with Palestinians who were resident in mandatory Palestine before May of 1948, which is when the war broke out, and then subsequently lost both their home and their livelihood as a result of the 1948-1949 conflict. That status passes through the paternal line. So at this point, um, UNRWA is responsible for well over 5 million Palestinians living in um, Gaza, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. And UNRWA is not just supplying food, it's the full range of humanitarian assistance. For example, it is central um, to efforts to ensure that um, all children in Gaza are getting uh, access to primary education. They run health clinics, et cetera. It, like many UN agencies that do humanitarian work, <clears throat> including the World Food Program and the UN Children's Fund, almost 100% reliant on voluntary contributions. So they're UN agencies, but the UN regular budget doesn't actually pay for them. Right? So as you can see, the United States is the largest donor and has been for a very long time, the largest donor um, to UNRWA. But, the Israelis um, <clears throat> supplied evidence to the United Nations that uh, 12 UNRWA workers um, had been participants in the October 7 attack. UNRWA fired them immediately. Two, two of them were already dead, but the rest of them, they fired them. Um, the UN has opened an investigation. There are a number of other investigations being done by um, independence groups or by states into this um, but as a result of those um, allegations, most of UNRWA's major Western donors paused their funding. Okay. In recent weeks, as it has become clear that the humanitarian situation is sliding towards catastrophe, a number of states have restored their funding. Australia, Canada, Sweden, the European Union, um, Germany is likely to do this in the next several weeks as well and there's been a real scramble by other states to try to come back in um, to provide UNRWA uh, funding. Apparently, the bill that is going before Congress to try to prevent the government from closing down by Friday um, <coughs> will include that the United States <coughs> cannot provide funding to UNRWA through March of 2025. Right? The United States is the largest donor to this agency and is going to be completely cut off. It looks entirely, I mean, this bill is very likely to pass because it's in everybody's interest, obviously, to make sure that the government does not shut down. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Problem with all of this um, is that right now, UNRWA is the only agency that is capable of providing humanitarian assistance on the ground in Gaza. It, it is 13,000 employees, of whom 3,000 are still working um, in its emergency phase. Of all of the other agencies that are on the ground, um, so the Ministry of Social Development, that's the Ham a Hamas government agency, um, and then the rest of them are either UN or uh, international NGOs. These are the only ones that have any staff on the ground. So there's 24 <coughs> total international agencies that are operating in Gaza, but only 10 of them have staff, right? Um, the World Food Program, for example, has 100 people working for it in Gaza. Um, humanitarian agencies across the board have said um, UNRWA cannot be replaced, especially not now. There is no way to do what UNRWA does, right? And it's not just that UNRWA, again, is, I mean, at this stage, it is almost entirely focused on providing food aid but it's also responsible for things like education and healthcare, et cetera. 
One of the things that the UN or the, um, the United States and Israel have suggested is let the World Food Program do this. Let move the staff from UNRWA over to the WFP and then let the World Food Program distribute the aid, right? To try to get around this notion that UNRWA um, is connected to, uh, or 12 people who worked for UNRWA were connected to Hamas. The World Food Program, though, itself is saying, this is not feasible. And one of the reasons is because they only have 100 people on the ground there. But the second one is, they said, people who work for the World Food Program make three times the salary than people who work for <clears throat> UNRWA do. And so if you shift people to some of these other humanitarian aid agencies, the cost of delivering aid is going to go up. You're also um, basically just taking the name UNRWA off of it to assuage Israel, but you're still going to be using the same individuals, right? This is highly, highly, highly problematic, right? Um, and you can see why in a minute. Okay, how does aid get into um, the Gaza Strip? <clears throat> so everything comes into this airport in <clears throat> Egypt. It's either trucked in, it comes into Port Said, which is roughly right there, by boat, and then it is trucked to the airport. You load it onto trucks, and then you take it um, about 28, 27 or 28 miles from the airport up to Rafa, which is the Egyptian border crossing <clears throat> into Gaza. At that point, it then has to go 25 miles. It gets some inspection here, but then it has to go 25 miles down to the Natanza crossing in Israel. The truck is unloaded for inspection. Once it has passed the inspection, everything is loaded back onto the truck, and then it goes here, either through the Rafa crossing or the Karem Shalom crossing, which is in Israel, right? Um, the aid is unloaded on the other side and loaded onto trucks that then go into Gaza. And then those trucks are generally unloaded into um, warehouses, right? So the food distribution <clears throat> places. The problem with this is, of course, this is a, a time consuming process. It takes anywhere from three weeks to one month to get an aid shipment into the, um, into the Gaza Strip. Um, and there is a tremendous backlog. Um, there are at least 1,200 trucks that are ready to go. that are sitting <clears throat> at El Arish Airport waiting to be able to go through the inspection to try to get them into, into Gaza. So two days after the um, October 7 attack, um, the Israeli Prime Minister, uh, Yoav Gallant, said, I've ordered a complete siege on the Gaza Strip. There will be no electricity, no food, no fuel. Everything is closed. We are fighting human animals, and we are acting accordingly. This is the ISIS of Gaza. There was a great deal of blowback um, because of the, under international humanitarian law, it's illegal to put a complete humanitarian blockade on an area. So on October 18th, Israel said it would allow food, water, and medicine to come in from, from Egypt, right? So that's from the, the Rafa crossing. They couldn't get enough aid in through there. And so on December 17th, uh, the Israelis also opened um, a crossing um, that is in Israel itself. Prior to October 7th, um, the number of trucks on average that were going into Gaza was 500 trucks a day. This line is tracking how many trucks have gone in through um, the early part of March. This line is 100 trucks a day. There were a number of days in February when fewer than 10 trucks were able to cross into Rafa. The World Food Program is saying at this stage, you need 300 food trucks alone a day that are going to be going into Gaza if we are going to stop the imminent famine from um, unraveling. Okay. So you have these huge lines um, waiting to get inspection on the, part of the, um, on the part of the Israelis. So why is there such um, a humanitarian uh, bottleneck? Why are we having such trouble getting aid into, into Gaza? The first piece is basically um, because there are very limited amounts of aid that are being cleared to enter by Israeli authorities. 
Oxfam, Save the Children, all the major UN agencies, Human Rights Watch, etc., have all recently released um, reports in which, as Oxfam said, there is a malicious bureaucracy at work. They note that um, the Israelis are having, um, so <clears throat> when the aid comes in, they unload the trucks, they inspect the contents. If there's a single dual use item in that shipment, the whole thing gets put back onto the truck and the truck gets sent back out. And you might think, well, then they shouldn't put dual use items on the trucks. Well, the Israelis have not released a list of what qualifies as a dual use item. They also will not tell the humanitarian agencies what was the dual use item, right? So they say, no, you don't pass your inspection, you have to go back, but they're not telling them why. Um, and so there's enormous frustration um, around this that it's just simply taking so long that in some cases the, the food is um, spoiling before they can get it through this inspection process. You also, on the um, Israeli border crossing, you have um, a, a, actually a, a small but very diverse group of Israelis. They're secular and religious. Um, <clears throat> many of them uh, are either families of or have connections to hostages that are still being held in Gaza. <laughs> they do not want to allow any humanitarian assistance to enter Gaza Strip until the hostages are released. And so um, they have been blocking this crossing multiple times, uh, and that's another aspect for why we're having so much trouble getting um, humanitarian system, humanitarian assistance into, um, into the Gaza Strip. There are a couple of other reasons um, as well. Uh, one of them is that you have um, the breakdown, complete breakdown of um, civil order within Gaza. Palestinian police guard humanitarian aid shipments. The Palestinian police are employed by Hamas, <clears throat> and so they are targets of the Israeli military. And so Hamas then pulled its police from protecting those um, convoys. That led to uh, criminal gangs seizing the convoys. The price of food has just gone off the scales in Israel or in, um, in Gaza. And so for some criminal gangs, if they can seize a shipment of humanitarian aid, <clears throat> they can sell it at greatly inflated um, prices to desperate people in the markets. There have also been several instances in recent weeks um, where there have been military strikes against Palestinians who have swarmed a humanitarian aid truck, including one that killed over 100 people um, last week. It is very difficult to get aid to the northern part of Gaza because the only openings into Gaza are those two in the south, and anything that comes in goes in in the south and then has to get up north. So at the end of February, the World Food Program, for example, had to suspend its deliveries into the north of Gaza because the, I mean, the, it's just an absolute, everything about it, it's, um, they can't be sure of the safety of their drivers and their cargo. The road conditions are terrible. Um, these are active combat zones and the Israelis are still fighting um, in these areas. Uh, and so they could not risk having people um, taking aid into uh, the northern part of the Gaza Strip. So there's an agency, um, it's a consortium of a number of different uh, humanitarian aid agencies, um, which puts all of these numbers together to um, monitor situations of uh, food insecurity. It has a five-stage insecurity scale. Um, it starts at minimal, then stressed, crisis, emergency, catastrophe is stage five. Since they started doing this, there have only been two other instances in which they have raised the level um, to stage five catastrophe. Okay? The entire Gaza Strip is now in phase four, which is the, considered the emergency phase. And in the north, they're saying that two-thirds of the population there is already in the catastrophe phase. The World Food Program is estimating that in any given 30-day period, the 300,000 people that are stuck in the north of Gaza on 10 days out of 30 will not have anything to eat day or night. Okay? So, and then 
As you get further towards the south, this of course is where all the IDPs are. Um, the catastrophe level goes down. That's for right now. This is for what they're saying could happen over the next number of months. And they're putting the entire northern half of Gaza into um, the famine level. Basically what this means is for phase five, these individuals are facing risk of starvation. Okay. People that are in the emergency phase are um, close to being starving. Lots of times when people are in these sorts of situations, um, you have coping mechanisms. So you spend whatever money you have left. Um, of course, most people are internally displaced. They don't have any possessions. They don't have any money, so they can't do that. People have been resorting to eating animal fodder um, and making um, soup out of a, a green weed that ordinarily is not fit for human consumption. But the UN agencies, they are all saying, look, people's coping strategies have ended. They don't have any more room, right? Literally, children have starved to death already in Gaza. It is only going to get worse moving forward. Right? And this is not the sort of thing the minute humanitarian assistance gets on the ground that this, that this ends. That isn't how this works, right? Because people, especially children, who have been acutely malnourished over a period of time have long-term health consequences. In Tigray, where there was a humanitarian blockade, 15 months after food aid got into that area, people were still dying of starvation. So I, I, I see these all the time because I, I teach about um, humanitarian crises uh, in one of my classes. I literally have never seen maps that look like this. Okay. Haiti, by the way, is in the yellow and the green area, stressed and minimal, just to give you some piece of comparison there. Okay. Another aspect of this is the enormous damage to agricultural areas. And this is, again, why this is going to get worse moving forward, because people could grow food in the Gaza Strip, but they can't grow food anymore. The orange areas um, are agricultural lands that have been damaged or destroyed um, in the conflict. You know, this is um, uh, November, this is December, this is January. By the way, these are UN satellite images. All of this is um, uh, available on the UN website. Um, at least 626 wells, for example, um, have been damaged or destroyed. So even once the war is, the fighting is over, right, it's going to take a very long time to be able to get the Gaza Strip back to a point where it's able to produce very much food for itself. Right? There are two other pieces about this that um, are complicating it. One is that um, the only port in Gaza City as basically is inoperable. Um, these areas here in these boxes are all breaches in the port. There are almost no boats anymore that are, um, that are in here. This outlined area up here um, with the little boxes in it, those are greenhouses. All right, that's what it looked like um, in November, right? or December rather. This is what it looks like now. This is what happens when you heavily bomb an area. I mean, it literally practically liquefies the earth. So those greenhouses obviously are not there anymore, so they are not operable. And then the last piece is in the south, because all these people have been crammed into the bottom of um, of the Gaza Strip. These are agricultural lands here. You can see the green fields, right? Um, now, this whole area, these are all temporary shelters for internally displaced persons. So agricultural land in the south that hasn't been damaged or destroyed is actually now not used because you've got huge numbers of people that are living on it. And the humanitarian aid community has also noted that this makes it really difficult um, to fairly distribute aid 
because of the incredibly haphazard way that the internally displaced peoples are crammed into Gaza. I mean, this is already one of the most densely populated places in the world, and, and now nearly the whole population has been shoved into one-fifth of that territory. So I cannot, again, stress enough um, how serious the humanitarian crisis is that we are facing in Gaza. There are going to be pictures of starving children on the front pages of the newspapers. They've already started, right? And again, this is not something that is quick and easy to fix in the short term. Okay, um, let me move down to, uh, yes, all right. So we have seen now um, efforts at some desperate measures. We, the World Central Kitchen, which is a, an international NGO, sent a, a ship with 200 tons of food on it into the Gaza Strip. They used rubble to construct this jetty right, to bring this in. This is expensive and logistically quite complicated because you've got to unload the stuff from the boat onto the jetty and then load it onto trucks on shore for it to be able to move forward. Um, they're not saying where it happened, but World Central Kitchen has said that it's um, the uh, material on the boat was inspected by Israel before it was allowed to, to go in. And there's a second boat that World Central Kitchen is sending um, to try to get a, this is in the, um, right at kind of like at the center of Gaza, where this, is, uh, <coughs> this jetty has been built. So they're gonna try to get some of that aid into the north. The United States, um, again, under heavy, heavy pressure um, to do something about this, has started airdropping supplies. A airdropping supplies is expensive, right? It's inefficient. It killed five people, right, already, because when it drops from the sky, sometimes people can't get out of the way of those pallets. And, and this is a known problem. In previous efforts, when the U.S. has airdropped, Food supplies you almost always end up killing a handful of people um, when those pallets um, come down. Okay? And so the United States is going to continue trying to do this. Biden has also announced that the United States is going to build a floating pier um, in off the coast of, of Gaza. The problem is it's going to take 60 days and 1,000 U.S. military personnel to get that going. People in Gaza do not have 60 days right, for food to show up for them. International humanitarian aid community is very frustrated about this because everyone keeps pointing out, um, and I mean, the United States knows this as well. The cheapest, most efficient and effective way to deliver humanitarian aid is by truck. So what the United States should be doing is not defunding UNRWA but returning funding to that agency, especially in this crisis period. The U.S. needs to insist with the Israelis that they open humanitarian corridors into Gaza with more streamlined. It cannot take three weeks for everything to go in. If you're gonna have um, a blacklist of dual use items, then you need to have a list published so the humanitarian agencies need to know what to do. Okay? I would also note the kinds of things that Israel has actually turned back included um, wood poles for tents, steel-toed boots, which emergency workers need, um, medical uh, agencies like uh, Doctors Without Borders who said they haven't been able to bring in generators and other kinds of medical equipment because it's been deemed um, a dual use. So all of those things are steps the Biden administration could take immediately to try to get the United States on the right side of this humanitarian crisis. It, now I'm going to skip back forward here to my, uh, uh, yes, yeah, okay. The one kind of problem with this, so funding UNRWA is not a problem. The U.S. could actually do that. It doesn't need Israel's permission to do that. It doesn't need Israel's permission to tell the Israelis that they should, for example, open up humanitarian aid um, corridors. 
we often make the assumption, because we give Israel $3 billion or more a year, that this gives the United States significant leverage over the Israelis. First, I would say, I do not believe that the Biden administration has the political will to actually use the leverage the U.S. has. They're, I mean, they have explicitly said they are not going to cut the Israelis off from military aid in an effort to try to get them to change what they are, what they are doing. That's, that's not, that is not going to happen. The other side of this is, are the Israelis persuadable, right? So leverage only works if the U.S. has the political will to use it, and if the Israelis are susceptible to political leverage. Um, and I would argue that right now, um, they are not. It, so this is just to give you um, a little bit of context, um, because a lot of the, the next slides talk about right, center, and left in Israel. I would just note, the left is only 11% of the electorate. The right is 62%. So what really matters is what does the right think in, in Israel? Recent public opinion um, has been very clear on a number of different things. They believe that um, you need to continue to use military pressure against Hamas so that the hostages are released, which means um, they're Israel is not really interested in a humanitarian ceasefire unless the hostages are released as part of that. You have um, significant opposition amongst the Jewish public in Israel against the possibility of an independent, demilitarized Palestinian state. So thinking about what happens the day, you know, over the day after. Um, Just like Biden is worried about his reelection in November, Benjamin Netanyahu is worried about his political future in <coughs> Israel. So if you call new elections in Israel, it will take um, three months uh, before the elections can be held. So that's why, that's why there's this particular thing. Okay? Um, as you can see, very few people want the elections to be held in November of 2026. People are saying when the war is over, they want new elections, or they want new elections right now. It, well, if they call the elections in Israel right now, Benjamin Netanyahu is out of power, and the, the entire um, uh, opposition thing is going to shift. Okay? So in the most um, recent opinion polls that they did in Israel when they asked people um, uh, about this, if the elections were held today, the leading party would be National Unity um, by Benny Gantz. They would win 37 seats, up from the 12 that they already have. Likud would go from the 32 seats that it has to only 18. The opposition would go from having 51 seats to 73 seats. And Netanyahu's coalition would go from having 64 seats to 47 seats. Netanyahu fears elections and he fears the end of the war because when the fighting stops, the questions will have to be answered about how this could possibly have happened, right? So Benjamin Netanyahu has an interest in ensuring um, that, there, that the fighting continues, right? From a political perspective, that's what makes the most sense um, for him. That is why um, Netanyahu has been extremely um, harsh with, uh, with Joe Biden, you know, the Biden administration is telling you you can't go into Rafah. You cannot launch an offensive into Rafah. The half the population of Gaza is stuck in that small area. Where are they going to go? Right? And um, Netanyahu has made very clear after his phone conversation with, um, with Biden that that was unacceptable, that they were, in fact, going to launch a military um, operation into Rafa when they're going to do that. I mean, he didn't say, but he made it clear that they have no intention of, of doing what the United States would like them um, to do. Okay. So the U.S. is in a really, really hard situation with this. It's tied to Israel because of the amount of money and the amount of military assistance that, that it provides, yet it has very little leverage over what the Israelis are doing. And the situation in Gaza is now sliding um, to the point of catastrophe, and that is reflecting or will reflect back on the United States. 
right? So there are, are major consequences for the United States um, of trying to get on the right side of the humanitarian crisis in, um, in Gaza. Uh, but it's, it's difficult to see um, how this is gonna not have a bad ending. It's very hard to see that this is gonna be solved in any kind of, um, like a permanent ceasefire is just not right now acceptable to the, um, to the Israelis, right? The last point I'll make, 75% of Israelis um, do not believe that humanitarian aid should be allowed into the Gaza Strip until the hostages are released, which is another point of domestic pressure on Benjamin Netanyahu, why he is taking a hard line against opening up humanitarian aid corridors from the south of, um, uh, from the south of Gaza. Um, so I'm happy to take um, any questions that people um, might have, any comments. Um, By the way, there's an enormous amount of, um, of information that you can get from uh, humanitarian aid agencies like Oxfam and Save the Children. Uh, all the satellite imagery um, that shows like before and after pictures of damage of different places is all available publicly from the UN satellite imagery. Um, and there are a couple of uh, consortiums of independent people that are also using that satellite in imagery. But I mean, all of that kind of um, information is, is readily available um, if, if you search for it. In your opinion, if Hamas released the hostages tomorrow, is this war over? No, I don't think so, because the Israelis have set basically unconditional surrender as the end target, that Hamas must be destroyed. And so that's the reason why they don't want um, a permanent ceasefire, because that apparently one of the deals that has, is being discussed in, in Doha at the negotiations is a permanent ceasefire in exchange for um, the remaining hostages. Except the Israelis say that's not acceptable because it doesn't destroy Hamas. So the, the leader of Hamas's military wing is still in somewhere in Gaza. Um, and uh, the leader of the interior leader of the political wing is also still there. And the Israelis want to completely wipe out um, Hamas's command and, and control. I think this is an unrealistic um, idea. Uh, that you know, Hamas is, is not just an organization. There's a political philosophy that goes with it, and you're not going to be able to completely destroy that. Um, but no, I think even if the hostages were released tomorrow, there's still likely that the Israelis are going to um, go into Rafah. They want to. They just. They want Hamas to be completely um, eliminated. How do the majority of Palestinians feel about Hamas? So we don't know because people can't freely express their opinions of before October 7th of, about, um, about Hamas. Um, but I will say that you know, this, people often say, well, the Palestinians in Gaza, they voted for Hamas. The story of that election is much more complicated, um, but also, it was in 2006. 50% of Gaza's population is under the age of 18, so they didn't vote in that election. 28% of Gaza's population is under the age of 10. Right? So the notion that, um, and by the way, in the 2006 elections, um, Hamas got 44% of the vote across Gaza and the West Bank. Most of them were protest votes against the corruption, nepotism, or leadership of the um, Palestinian Authority. Um, there was not a single district in Palestine where Hamas actually won, like got the majority of votes. What happened was Hamas was smart and they only ran one candidate per district. Fatah, on the other hand, was not smart and they ran multiple candidates for district. They split the vote and then that allowed um, Hamas candidates with pluralities of the vote to be able to, um, to, to take control. Um, there, 
there are, are certainly many people in amongst the Palestinians who chafe at the um, authoritarian nature of Hamas at its restrictions on women, um, at its human rights abuses, um, et cetera. Um, but you know, in many ways, ultimately, it really doesn't matter because this is a civilian population. And it's a bedrock principle of international humanitarian law that you discriminate between civilians and combatants, which is precisely what Hamas did not do on October 7th. Right? It's everyone that it saw it felt was fair game. Um, and that we have to ensure that that line is respected between civilians and combatants. How does Hamas had to have known this was going to be the response, right? So it's hard to. So there has been a fairly consistent. Um, dynamic since the Oslo Accords between Hamas on the far end for the Palestinians and then really between Benjamin Netanyahu and the right in Israel on the right on that side okay? which is they know that if one of them uses violence the other one is going to retaliate with violence right? um, it actually serves both purposes it, because it feeds a security narrative on both sides that you have to protect against these um, against these enemies, it, um, and so I think that there's some of that is still um, is still operating now. This this same dynamic that um, Hamas was afraid that what was happening was that the Palestinian issue was sliding off the international agenda completely because of the possibility that Saudi Arabia was going to sign on to the Abraham Accords and recognize Israel. And so Hamas wanted to prevent that from happening. So yes, they certainly were aware that there would be extensive violence. I think there's two things here, though. One, I don't think Hamas thought they were going to get as far as they did. It, it is staggering, the security breach that took place in Israel on October 7th. Absolutely staggering. Right? Um, it's, it, it's not just that, that Hamas overran the border, it's how long it took Israeli security forces to come to people's rescue. Right? So I, I don't think Hamas thought that they were going to be as successful as as they were. Um, and Israel traditionally, when it has responded to Hamas violence from Gaza, engages in intensive aerial bombardment, but it doesn't want to send its ground forces into Hamas because into Gaza because um, Hamas is entrenched and it doesn't want to suffer heavy casualties. So it's been very rare since 2005 that the Israeli um, military has been willing to go in with ground forces. And so I think that um, Hamas miscalculated um, about just how massive the response was going to be, at least partially because I suspect they did not think that they were going to be, from their perspective, as successful as they were on October 7th. Is it um, my understanding that Hamas is supported by Iran? Yes. So Iran is giving them all the money that they want. And Hamas is on the ground because they have massive tunnels all through the whole Gaza. So how are you going to fight something? I mean, it's almost like a can of worms. Yeah. So on the, on the Iran piece, um, the Iranians are largely supplying Hamas um, with weapons, right? So there's a clandestine flow of weapons into the Gaza um, that Iran is able to, to do. There was a, a one-year period where um, Iran cut Hamas off because they were on opposite sides of the war in Syria. Um, because 
Hamas is, is not, they're not Shia Muslims, they're Sunni, so th there's not that ideological, religious um, connection there. Hamas also, though, um, has been receiving about $300 million a year in payments from um, Qatar in the Persian Gulf. With the encouragement and knowledge of the Israeli government, Netanyahu's um, his calculation was let the money continue to go into um, into Gaza. It ran the it paid for the fuel to run the power plant in Gaza. It paid civil salaries, civil service salaries. Um, it also paid for uh, like public assistance, right? But then that's money that. Hamas doesn't have to spend on those things. It can then push towards its military, its military efforts. Um, so the Iranians don't have the same kind of relationship with Hamas that they have with Hezbollah, for example, in Lebanon. Um, certainly, the Iranians could lean on Hamas, um, but they can't tell them what to do. But that's part of the bigger picture here. Um, thinking about the whole region is that um, Iran is in the is in the background here, right? And and ultimately that's probably Israel's biggest enemy, and and the biggest threat to Israeli security comes from comes from Iran um, in the region. Right? And yes, there are um, some estimates say it's as many as 450 miles of tunnels underneath Gaza. That's partially again why the Israelis oftentimes don't want to send the ground forces in. Um, it's why they've been using 2,000 pound bombs um, in Gaza because they're trying to collapse the tunnels that are um, that are underneath of them. Um, it's probably even more, Gaza is probably an even more fraught um, environment to fight in than Mosul was in Iraq when the US and the Iraqi forces were trying to get ISIS out of the, out of the city. And that took ultimately, um, you know, took a while to get to the point that they could lay siege to the city, but that was a nine month long battle to clear ISIS out of, um, out of Mosul. So, you know, the Israelis have only been in since October 7th. Um, and so, I mean, that's at least part of the reason why this is, um, this was never going to be a, a quick and easy war, I guess is the way to say that. Why would Hamas uh, give up their hostages? They would lose all their bargaining chips. And if Israel isn't going to stop the war, I, I don't see any point in them losing their, their bargaining chip. No, I mean, that's, that is precisely the point that um, God or uh, Hamas's negotiators in Doha, that's what they've said. If we give up, if we just release the hostages um, without a permanent ceasefire, um, then we've given up the only bargaining chip that we have. And, and so that's why um, you know, Hamas is not just simply going to surrender um, to the Israelis. They're not going to release the hostages unless there is some kind of a deal. I think the Biden administration has asked Netanyahu to send a bunch of um, military and intelligence professionals to the U.S. early next week because they want to talk to them about there is an alternative way to go after Hamas's leadership that doesn't involve a military offensive on the ground into Rafah. So they're going to try to sell them on the notion that they don't need to destroy every last Hamas cadre and that they'll still be able to go after um, Hamas leadership in a much more targeted way so that the humanitarian um, crisis doesn't get any more dire than, than it already is. But yeah, you're exactly right. Hamas is, is going to want something um, before it's going to release their hostages. And another thing, the Israelis have been making uh, settlements all over in Palestinian land they're booting the Palestinians out of their homeland that they've been on for thousands of years. And I'm sure there's a little animosity going on because of that, but they just keep building settlements in, in uh, 
Israel and Palestine all, all the time. And, and they, they don't think anything bad about that. The settlements are, are going to be the biggest obstacle to the ability to actually get a, a negotiated two-state solution um, because there are over 500,000 Israeli settlers in the West Bank. 40% um, of East Jerusalem's population are Israeli settlers. Um, there are Israeli settlers also in um, the Golan Heights, but that's not Palestinian. That, that territory belongs to Syria. Um, but yes, the, the settlements are a massive obstacle to any sort of um, two-state solution. It seems fairly apparent that Ariel Sharon, who was, who was prime minister in Israel in 2005, he withdrew from Gaza in 2005 and dismantled the Israeli settlements that were in Gaza. There were only, I think there were 8,000 Israeli settlers that were there precisely because he believed it would allow Israel to maintain control over the West Bank. Right? And no one wanted Gaza because it's incredibly impoverished, um, you know, it's incredibly crowded, it's a very difficult population to control, and so the Israelis would just seal it off. But then they could say, we withdrew, and then it would increase the possibility that they would be able to um, keep the West Bank. And that has sort of been the strategy that um, Netanyahu has been using as well. That if, you, if Hamas is in power in Gaza, you can use that to undercut the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, then you can say, I can't negotiate because I don't have a negotiating partner. And every year you get further down the line and you get more Israeli settlers in the West Bank is another year that makes it that much more difficult to unravel this, this whole thing. So yes, settlements are, um, you know, if you're thinking about, okay, what's the day after? Like what happens after the fighting stops in Gaza and the humanitarian situation is brought in, into hand? Well, then what? And it isn't apparent that the Israelis have a day after plan. I mean, some of you might remember that when this first happened, the United States told the Israelis not to go in. They said, don't do what we did in Iraq. <laughs> We've invaded countries without plans. We discovered it doesn't go well, right? <laughs> Take our word for it. Um, but like the United States was after 9-11, um, the Israelis were just in no mood to um, not immediately retaliate um, against the against the Gaza Strip. I think there was a question. Yeah, I, I guess maybe this is a two-part question. So if we're talking about the negotiations and the settlement, have we not seen examples of the settlements being used as launching sites for other things like missiles and that? And that's why those settlements got you know, pushed back into by Israel? So the, the settlements are actually Israelis who have yeah, moved into Yeah, but I think they pushed territory. and expanded into those because there was things coming out of those uh, areas before. No, not in not in the West Bank. Well, it, either way, they've been launching things out. So I think the other part with negotiations, have we ever seen any examples of successful negotiations between parties such as Hamas or whatever, you know, PLO, you name it? Like good faith negotiations. You know, we see negotiations and all of a sudden we see the things violated. So, is there a history of any successful negotiations and that side holding to their end of the bargain? The Good Friday Accords in Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. the transition um, in South Africa from black or from apartheid to black majority rule would be the first two I would say off the top of my head. Excellent, but that's not Israel and Gaza. No, but if you're asking, is it impossible for two um, yeah. parties like this? To yeah, I'm asking about some kind these of an two, agreement. Though. Yeah, I'm asking about these two, not you know, areas that might actually have a little more decency with the negotiations. So I think with that, the other part. The uh, Camp David Accords. Good. And those held up for a while, right? The peace treaty with Jordan, between Israel and Jordan. Okay, again, those parties. We're talking these particular parties here. Next question. Um, if we look at the area, you know, that area that they're getting rammed into, Rafa, and yet, aren't they able to maybe go south? Isn't Egypt in them? Are they still keeping them at the border? The Egyptians do not want the Palestinians to come into Egypt because Israel will not allow them to go back. Okay, which is fair, right? Okay, and I, that's a fair answer on that. So, you know, once you're out, you're out. 
That's right. And yeah. and that's the other piece to it too is the Egyptians are very sensitive about Sinai because there is an Islamic State affiliate. Um, the remnants of that are still working um, in Sinai. Mm -hmm. There was a, a full-fledged insurgency there for a while that right. the Egyptians were able to put down. But they're, um, the last thing that they, they want is a huge refugee population. But the biggest reason is the Israelis won't let them back. And was that an insurgency? Was that caused by the Palestinians? No. Which, was, which faction was that that caused that insurgency? In the Sinai was the Islamic State. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Maybe uh, kind of a longer term question. Uh, Israel keeps expanding these settlements like most westernized countries see their birth rates decrease and don't necessarily need to keep expanding land-wise. Is Israel's population uh, a sign of difference? So that's a very interesting question. Um, so Israel is about um, 9 million population is about 9 million. The fastest growing portion of Israel's population um, are uh, the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox. Um, and this is a real, um, you know, thinking about Israeli politics before October 7th, this was a real concern in Israel because suddenly, like, I think it's almost 20 or 25 percent of kids in grade school are, are, are Haredi children. And for secular Israelis, this is just a lot. Yeah, they are not pleased yeah. about this. But the other population that has a fairly significant growth rate in, in Israel um, are Palestinian Israelis. Um, and then if you're thinking about the sort of the whole thing together, so Israel plus Gaza, West Bank, East Jerusalem, you have 2.2 million Palestinians who live in Gaza. You have about 3 million Palestinians who live in the West Bank. Um, several hundred thousand who live in East Jerusalem. But when you add it all up, basically what, what you've got is close to parity between Jewish Israelis and Palestinian Arabs in that general territory. Um, and this is why so there are three possibilities. You can have the status quo, right? What if everything's like it is now and it doesn't change. Two state solution, right? Palestinian state, Israeli state. And for a while, some people were arguing for a one-state solution, right? Equal citizen for everybody who lives there. The problem with that is then Israel ceases to be a Jewish state. And for most people, that is, especially Israelis, that is just not an acceptable outcome. Um, but yeah, the, the birth rate issue for Israel is, is more about the secular religious divide um, within its own community. It's, I was going to say, yeah, we do have a book in the library called Bibi, and it was written by Netanyahu, and he spent uh, quite a bit of time living in the United States. He was very connected. Yes. Uh, question politically. I believe the number is somewhere between 10 and 12 Jewish settlements. How does this all play into it politically? So how does the whole, the whole Gaza war play into the yeah. into the Senate? Yeah. How, uh, as far as America connected to the situation to ten to twelve years, I would say. So um, there are a couple of domestic political implications for this. One is that um, younger voters and um, Arab American voters and and, and other um, sectors are increasingly saying that they will not vote for Biden in November, right? Um, and given how close uh, our most recent elections is, that's a, that's a, that's a big threat to Biden um, in terms of, of re-election. Within the Democratic Party, you're starting to see some pressures, like Chuck Schumer just came out um, and was very, very critical um, of the Israelis in this public speech. And then Netanyahu apparently um, yesterday or today, asked Chuck Schumer if he could address only Senate Democrats in a closed session. Um, and Schumer said no. As he said, this make, then, that makes it a partisan issue, so no, you can't just address one party over the other. But there are real tensions within the Democratic Party, um, you know, younger activists, progressive activists, et cetera, 
um, versus more like the old guard, like um, like Chuck Schumer, right? The other thing to think about in terms of U.S. domestic politics and the situation in Israel is that, you know, I think the percentage of Jews in the United States is, is not even 2% anymore. At best, it would be 3%. The biggest supporting group for Israeli policies in the United States are evangelical Protestants. Um, and they have a particular um, religious interpretation of that the Israelis should control the Holy Land in order for the Second Coming to happen. Okay. Uh, and so they are, um, the American Jewish vote is very divided. There are many people um, in the American Jewish community who um, oppose Netanyahu, um, who don't like what, the, uh, what Israel is doing right now, but Domestically, for Americans, it's evangelical Christians. That's the, the core of the um, sort of pro-Israel um, coalition in the United States. The ones that are least likely to be persuaded um, that the U.S. needs to change course on Israel. Whoever the next, say, three presidents are, wouldn't this, kind of going back to our work of topic of the day, wouldn't this situation make them further say, let's get out of the Middle East? I, I think Biden would also like to get out too, but there's, it's, you know, it's really- Attention the library movie. patrons, the time is 7.45 and the library will be closing in 15 minutes. Please gather your final selections. Thank you. I don't think that, that, that it's in the cards for the United States to reduce its footprint in, in the Middle East. Um, the freedom of navigation issue that has emerged with the, with the Houthis, the, so, you would think that China would be very interested in ensuring that boats can get through the Bab Dal Mandab Strait and into the Red Sea because most of the traffic that is being affected is actually coming from China. And China's building a blue water navy. China's not interested in a freedom of navigation operation to keep the Bab Al Mandab Strait open. Um, and so there are ways in which everyone looked to the United States when this happened. They're like, you guys need to fix this. Um, and um, yeah, I, I just, I, I don't see that um, the US is, is going to be able to make this pivot to Asia that it's been trying to do since the Obama administration, at, at least as long as Iran continues yeah. to be under the control of the Islamic Republic. Maybe if there's a regime change in Iran, then the security situation for the United States might change in the Middle East, but that doesn't look to be Likely. I mean, the Chinese disinterest is bizarre because they're much more reliant on energy from the Middle East than we are at this time. Exactly. Yes, but the, the Chinese are not. The Chinese are not interested in playing the leadership role that the United States takes in the current global order. They want a different global order where the United States is not the leading player, but they don't want to be that player. Right? So it would be a very different um, international order if it was the, the Chinese or the Russians that were the, the top power instead of the instead of the United States. They would guard their ships from over there. Most likely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you for coming. Um, thank you, Dr. Dodd, for being here.